So the final problem with uh, centralized finance is the lack of interoperability. So what do I really mean here? Um, in traditional finance, it's really difficult to integrate um, uh, products. Indeed, even within my own bank, uh, it is not straightforward to transfer funds from my bank account to the brokerage that the bank owns 100%. Okay, so, so even within a particular company, it is difficult uh, to do. We have to deal uh, in general with wire transfers that are not secure and are slow and are costly to actually do. So, um, so there are so many um, solutions that DeFi offers that kind of go beyond what we could ever imagine doing in uh, traditional uh, finance. So I want to introduce a concept called DeFi Legos. And the idea here is just like a Lego block. And you build a protocol that's based upon, let's say, uh, the Ethereum blockchain, and somebody else builds a protocol based on the, the Ethereum blockchain. And maybe it's really simple that it could be a token, so two different tokens. So it turns out that it's really easy to put those tokens into another smart contract together because they follow the same rules. They're both, for example, ERC-20, so they're compliant. So we can put these together and move them around across the different protocols. So even though your protocol might have its own token, it is able to house um, other tokens. So this is the idea of interoperability. This is completely different than the pain um, and the cost and the time that it takes to do simple things like a wire transfer from US dollars to euros. This is so different. It happens instantly, near instantly, and all of these tokens can interact with each other. So the idea here is that you can build something and then other people can build on top of what you're doing. And you become part of this structure. And think of it as a Lego castle. And you put a brick in and instantly you're connected with all of the other bricks. Okay, it's a very, very powerful idea and completely different than anything that we've experienced in centralized uh, finance. So essentially, we are able to combine existing protocols with other protocols. And indeed, we can create a new protocol by just combining um, a number of existing protocols. So again, you can't do this in uh, centralized finance. So um, tokenization, you know, I've mentioned a number of times already, this is really uh, important. Um, and there's so many different layers to it that we're going to explore in uh, the later courses. So there's tokens, you can place these tokens in liquidity pools. You can have another token that, re that represents your share of the liquidity pool. Okay, so uh, you can have a token that wraps another token. So there's so many possibilities here, but the key thing in decentralized finance is that all of these tokens can interact with each other. Because you know, they're based upon the same general uh, protocol. And tokenization is a really big thing. So it's one of the most exciting things uh, in this course, because I'm going to argue in the course that we soon will be able to tokenize almost anything. Okay, so uh, think of illiquid assets that are not traded uh, because they are illiquid, 
and maybe um, it'd be very costly to trade them, but you can actually tokenize them and easily trade them. So it might be uh, a piece of art that you tokenize, and many people can invest in that piece of art. So you'd have a share of the piece of art. And if it goes up in value, you would profit uh, from that. It could be uh, an asset, another asset. Uh, it could be land or something like that, where it's very illiquid, but you could tokenize that. You can tokenize services. There's so many different things that are possible that it opens up the possibility of a number of new assets. And anytime you bring in new assets, that's good because it reduces um, the frictions in the market. Uh, it allows people to diversify portfolios in a way that they couldn't diversify uh, before. And essentially, it unlocks value. It unlocks value in traditionally illiquid uh, assets. So there's a lot of possibility uh, here. It's also uh, possible to bundle uh, the tokens together. So the tokens could represent a share of stock. Well, you could bundle the tokens together into um, a DeFi equivalent of an ETF or exchange traded fund. And just think about the way that we progress. Went from mutual funds, very costly. We go to exchange traded uh, funds, which are lower cost, but still are costly. And then the next wave is a bundle in DeFi that is really super cheap to transact in. So there are many, many possibilities here uh, in terms of uh, tokenization. And again, it can be tokenized in terms of a virtual asset like Ethereum, or it could be tokenized in terms of a physical asset. There's many possibilities. It could even be tokenization of an intangible asset. They can be tokenization of service. There are so many possibilities here. But, of course, there are challenges. And let's be upfront. So, to tokenize a virtual asset is, is very straightforward because everybody can see it. it. Everything resides on the Ethereum blockchain, for example. But once we start tokenizing hard assets, then you have to have some trust. So if we tokenize gold, then that gold needs to be held in a vault somewhere. And that gold actually needs to be audited. And there's a cost associated with the audit and the vault. So some things are more difficult to tokenize than others. There's also potential legal uh, restrictions. So if you tokenize with Ethereum, then that doesn't exist anywhere. It exists only in blockchain nodes. But if you've got your collateral in a vault in, let's say, London, then you're potentially subject to the political risk that might unfold in the UK. So again, we need to look at this in a balanced way, that uh, there are advantages and disadvantages. My read is that the advantages uh, greatly outweigh the disadvantages. So there's this other uh, idea of uh, pluggable uh, derivative assets. So this is essentially um, a, an asset is created with the smart contract that's linked uh, to another asset, potentially on another platform. And uh, this is, uh, again, portable um, through the tokenization. We'll talk about Compound in some detail in the DeFi deep dive. And we'll go into much more detail as to what a uh, pluggable um, uh, derivative asset is. But I don't want to wait uh, until the third course. I want to give you a little bit of a preview. And let me just talk a little bit about Compound. So 
Compound is basically allows for lending. And uh, if you put liquidity in, you can actually accrue a variable um, interest rate. And uh, the position is a token in itself. So for example, if the base asset is Ethereum and you deposit some Ethereum, you get as a result a share of that pool. And that share is a new token. And it's called a C ETH. So small case um, C uh, with the ETH. And that can be used in place of a base asset like Ethereum in another protocol. So very, very powerful uh, idea. So essentially, if you think of Ethereum as a token, then this is a token on the token. Okay, so uh, again, you deposit your Ethereum, you can earn some interest on that, you get your share of that pool, then you can use that share to do other things. It's collateral in itself. So very, very powerful idea. Okay, so um, this is basically what we can do is have effectively, and this is in the true sense, a derivative asset, right? So the C ETH is a derivative of the Ethereum. And again, uh, this can be deployed and used to create uh, collateral or earn interest on itself. So again, this is a, a totally new world where you could actually issue a new token so easily based upon uh, an existing uh, token. So uh, there's also this idea of networked uh, liquidity. So, um, so this is the idea that um, it's pretty difficult in traditional finance to share liquidity. So uh, in traditional exchanges, it's just not, uh, it's not possible unless you're like a hedge fund and you've got a thing that's called a prime broker. So, so it's very, very limited, but within the space, it's really easy to share liquidity. And there's an incentive for doing that. You put your, your token in, you get a, a rate of return. So you, you're, you're thinking that Ethereum will go up in value in the future, you don't wanna sell it. So, but you don't want to not have it go to work. So it, the equivalent with uh, paper cash is to put it under the mattress versus putting it in the bank. So you put it in the bank supposedly to earn some interest. So you do the same thing with your Ethereum and it allows you to create liquidity in the same way as deposits create liquidity for lending uh, for the central um, centralized uh, financial institutions the traditional banks um, do uh, today. So, so this network liquidity uh, is important in that it allows um, us to basically harvest the liquidity from the crowd rather than um, the financial uh, institution that is centralized, that is opaque, and essentially has got to pay for all of the middle layers that we don't need to pay for in decentralized finance.